April 18th, 2022, I am going to interview Anna Rapkin in Berkeley, California by Zoom for the Berkeley Historical Society. Good afternoon, Anna. Hi. Would you tell us about your childhood, where you were born, when you were born, your family, your siblings? I was born in Krakow, Poland, in December 1935. Uh, my father was an attorney. My mother was a business manager. I had an older brother who was born in 1932 and a half-sister, Liana Liban, uh, who was the child of my mother's previous marriage. In those days, for a middle-class Jewish woman to divorce her first husband was quite a scandal. Uh, but my mother did it and my sister, my half sister, Liana, lived with us until she was about 16. But um, she was a very mischievous and rule breaking teenager and had major conflict with my father. So at some point, she moved out and lived with my grandmother. What languages did you learn? What were the first language you learned? Which ones did you learn in Krakow? My family only spoke Polish, so I learned Polish. Uh, when my parents didn't want us to understand what they were saying, they would start speaking German. But my brother learned German. So after a while, they couldn't keep their secret conversation secret. So they started speaking French and he never learned French. So those three languages were the ones that I grew up learning. And you did not learn Yiddish? No, um, my father came from an Orthodox family, a large family, there were 10 children. And his uh, father, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, spoke Yiddish. Uh, but interestingly enough, his family moved out of the Jewish quarter in Krakow and lived not very far from us in what was considered the Christian part of Krakow. Um. Did you have any religious education in Krakow? None whatsoever. My brother did. And once in a while, my maternal grandfather uh, was a reformed Jew. He was very mm. active in the neighborhood. In fact, he was the president of the neighborhood in Krakow. And once in a while, he would take my brother to temple with him but i had no no education whatsoever uh, are you religious today uh, uh, or you were born in a jewish family do you have um, a jewish identity and how is it uh, do you celebrate the uh, holidays at home passover Hanukkah, whatever. <laughs> uh, well, I was always around secular Jews. Yeah. Uh, I was never part of a religious Jewish community. Um, and when I married and we had children, my 
husband, who was brought up in a Reformed Jewish uh, New York family, um, wasn't uh, didn't continue that tradition. Mm -hmm. And when we had children, we decided that we would let them decide when they were uh, old enough to make that decision as to what religion they would like to um, be part of. My daughter did not become, I would call her a secular Jew. Um, my son became a Buddhist. Um, so I would say that my identity at this point is a cultural Jew. During the Holocaust, what happened to your family? Um, my father was a uh, captain in the Polish army. So at the end of August 1939, while we were on vacation in the mountains, he was called up. So he left. And shortly thereafter, he told my mother and the rest of the family to go back to Krakow. Um, but on September 1, 1939, the war started. And my mother, my grandmother, my half-sister, my brother and I um, left Krakow on the train, which was quite a, <laughs> a traumatic experience because as you can imagine, like now the Ukrainian mothers and children who are leaving the eastern part of Ukraine uh, the western part of Poland saw a huge refugee flow going east. So it was extremely hard to get on a train. At some point, which I don't really remember, uh, our father found us and we continued the journey east by car. And that I do remember because we were bought, the, the roads were being bombed. So he was strafed many times and had to get in and out of the car. Uh, but eventually we made it to what has now become a very famous city, Lviv, which is now mm. part of Ukraine. But um, at that time it was called Lviv and it was part of Poland. And it was occupied by the Russians. So how did you, um, uh, well, well that, that's the early part of uh, the uh, uh, German invasion uh, uh, from Lviv, uh, Lviv, from Lviv, uh, Lviv um, or Lemberg, I think it was at one time. Uh, what then happened? with your family and what happened to you? Well, um, in, my, in June of 1941, the uh, Russian-German pact was dissolved and the Germans occupied Lviv. Mm. Uh, and pretty much a few weeks later, uh, all of the Jews, about 200,000 Jews of that city, had to leave wherever they were living and move into the tenements where the Jews were already living. So you can imagine it was an incredibly crowded area. Uh, we were assigned, rented a room. So the four of us, because my grandmother and my half sister under the Russian occupation uh, were given a choice whether they wanted to stay and live or go back west to the German sector. And although my father begged them not to do it, they decided that's what they wanted to do. 
So they got on the train and of course the train didn't go west to the German sector. They ended up in labor camps in uh, Siberia. So the four of us were in the ghetto, my father, my mother, my brother and I. Mm. And my father was part of the slave labor force. He worked in a German factory making fumigation candles for the German army. And because he was a little bit out of the ghetto, he heard a lot of news. And in 1942, he heard that the Germans were going to liquidate the ghetto, which meant that they were basically going to either deport people or kill them. So he and a Polish Catholic friend of his arranged for our escape. And what that meant was that he bribed a German soldier who had a truck to come into the ghetto and take my brother and I out. Um, well, at that time, I was seven years old. And when my mother told me that this man who walked into our room with a big sack and told me to get into it, I didn't question. I just did what I was told because I was so traumatized by that point that I just did whatever I was told by grown-ups. So I was put in the sack and he took me out, took me to the truck and put me in the back of the truck where my brother was already uh, hidden with lots of other sacks that were in the back of the truck. So we were driven out of the ghetto that way and dropped off at the house of my father's friend, who I'll call Mr. K. Mr. K uh, was a Polish patriot. He hated the Nazis and was determined to do whatever he could to help. His wife was very reluctant to have two kids, their the elderly couple, childless. She was very reluctant to have us there because she knew that if they were discovered, it was sure death for them. But uh, he told her that it was a chance for two kids to be saved for Catholicism. That, um, our father had told him that if he and my mother didn't survive the war, that they would baptize us as Catholics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we spent two, two over two years with this um, couple. And it was a very difficult situation because there we were, two small children. My brother is three years older than I am. Uh, in one small room uh, with no toys, no games. We had two books. He had The Last of the Mohicans and I had a fair book of fairy tales. Um, he was very creative. He made me a dollhouse from a shoe box and we played tiddlywinks with buttons and pick up sticks with matches. But as you can imagine, um, it was aggravating for him and aggravating for me. So we had a lot of squabbles, <laughs> mm -hmm. but he looked after me. He became like a second father to me. And we had um, a couple of very close calls because the Gestapo came into the building looking for Jews. And the worst case was when they actually came into our room and we were in the bed under about half a dozen feather beds. I was convinced we were going to suffocate. You could hear them looking around, but they never picked up the feather beds and walked out. So a very close call.
then in 1944, our caretaker came to our room and sat down, which was very unusual. She usually just came in and gave us our food and told us that um, our parents were found in the hiding place that they were in and they were killed. And I was so, by that time, I was so numb of all emotion that all I could think about was that I was an orphan and that I would surely die because who would look after me? But the lady said, no, uh, we would stay there and they would look after us. Um, and we had been baptized secretly one night. Uh, and I became a true believer because I was told that I had a God was my father and Mary was my mother and they would look after me. So it seemed like a wonderful ending that I had parents in heaven, both my true parents and my religious parents. But then when the Russians occupied, reoccupied the I was sent to a convent school and the nuns uh, taught me my catechism and my little stories about Jesus mm -hmm. and I was very taken and I was very taken with the nuns who were very kind and wore beautiful habits and I decided I should become a nun also but my brother laughed at me and he would say you think that the sprinkling a little bit of water made you into something that you're not <laughs> and he said you are jewish and don't forget that so i was very confused i was a small child and i really didn't know mm. who i was or what i was It's just kind of an aside, I suppose what's taking place in Ukraine must bring, does it bring back memories and trigger memories of your experiences? And, it's pretty yeah. horrific. Yeah. Because the images of the mothers and children trying to get out, of course, was exactly what happened to us. And the yeah. bombing of civilian structures is exactly what happened to us when the Russians, the, the Russians, when, when the treaty between Germany and Russia was over, the Russians basically left Lviv. So the Germans didn't have to bomb the city. Mm. They just walked in. Hmm. But to retake the city, the Russians had to bomb. So hmm. we spent many, many hours in the cellars. And hmm. the building that we were hidden in was right next to the uh, German officers club. And so the fear was that the Russians would know that that was target and that they would bomb it. And sure enough, they did. But our building was stood. I mean, all the windows fell out. It was a huge mess. But the building was stood. For bombing. Any uh, education during those years you were in Lviv? Uh, uh, any, yeah, did you? Did, did you attend a school or did, what was there in terms of education for you? Well, during hiding, no. Yeah. Because we couldn't go outside. We were mm. basically imprisoned in that room for yeah. over two years. Huh. Um, my brother, I think, taught me the letters. Hmm. But really, my first 
school experience as such was when I was 10 years old, when I was sent to the convent school in a hmm. uh, And then, of course, all the children, I was the only Jewish child there. And the other children laughed at me because I didn't know how to read. I didn't know how to do my sums. I, I knew nothing. Um, although my brother claims now that he was trying to teach me, but I don't know whether I was so traumatized that I couldn't retain it or I don't know. But certainly I was way, way behind. Uh, so at the age of 10, my education started. Um, and then because we were now, quote, Catholic, uh, our caretakers sent us to church every Sunday. And one Sunday, totally by happenstance, it turned out that the distant relative of ours who had survived a child slightly older than my brother, survived the war in Lviv in hiding also, and had been baptized and had attended that particular church. She recognized my brother and was smart enough not to say anything and went to the Jewish committee in Lviv uh, who were looking for survivors and who had found her and told them that she saw these two kids who she knew. So the next Sunday, somebody from the Jewish committee went to the church and got in touch with my brother and uh, came back to the apartment and talked to our caretakers about taking us back to Krakow. But they said, no, absolutely not because they had promised our parents that only if a relative came to claim us could they let us go. Otherwise, my parents apparently told them that they wanted us to stay with them. So the Jewish committee lawyer left but kept in touch with my brother during school hours. And they came up with the plan that um, for the next few days, we were to take some clothing and some necessities to school with us, drop them off at uh, her house and not say anything, of course, to our caretakers. And then the day of what was going to be our escape, we were supposed to just pretend we were going to school as usual and not go, but go to her house. But Mr. K must have somehow become suspicious because as we were leaving, he asked my brother to open his satchel. And of course his satchel was full of no books, just his personal belongings. Mr. K became very, very angry, he told us to go back to our room and uh, not to leave. I was terrified. I, I, I thought this was the end. They would throw us out. Who knows what? But my brother said, no, no, just wait. We'll figure things out. And then we heard Mr. K leave the apartment. So my brother told me to go on the, uh, our room had a little balcony, which we're never allowed to use during the war, of course, because we couldn't be seen. But he told me to go on the balcony and brush my, I had long hair, brush my hair with my mother's silver hairbrush and to drop the brush onto the street and then go run out. And if Mrs. K came out to tell her that I had dropped by accident my mother's silver hairbrush and I had to pick it up. So I did that. 
but when I got to the hall, to the front door, she came out of the kitchen with a hot, she had been ironing. She had this hot iron in, his, in her hand. And she started yelling at me saying, what do you think you're doing? Didn't you hear what my husband said? You have to stay in your room. So I explained to her, of course I was terrified and I was crying. Um, what had happened, so she let me go. So I picked up the hairbrush and I ran. And to this day, I remember that it's the first time I remember running any distance. Number one. Number two, I got a terrible stitch in my side and I barely made it to the attorney's support. And then I was sitting there thinking, this, this is it, I've lost my brother. But he was able to get past him very easily because he was bigger than I was. And um, then we were moved several times because the different safe houses, because they were afraid that the case would tell the police that we were kidnapped. And you know, they would come to the attorney's house to look for us. Hmm. But then uh, eventually after, I don't know, two or three moves, the day came for us to go to the train station to go on the train to, to Krakow. So again, it was a, unimaginable how they got us onto this train because there were very few trains after the war. Many of the tracks had been bombed and they were not repaired. And so somehow they managed to get us squeezed into, that was a cattle car train, into one of the cattle cars. And I really don't know how long it took, but one night we stopped in a little town and we were told to get off. And then our group was told that we had to go under the train to get to the other track because that's where the train was that would take us west, further west. Well, I was convinced that the train would move and I would be under the train and <laughs> I would be cut to pieces. So I screamed and yelled that I wasn't going to go under the train at all. My, my brother literally had to sort of like push me under the So mm -hmm. finally I got through and I got onto the other train. And then we made another stop in a little town and I had to get off the train and spend the night in that town. And during the night, we heard this huge, huge amount of noise and shots. And I was convinced that the war had started all over again. Was, the Germans had come back. I, I, I couldn't imagine what was happening. Well, it turned out to be VE Day and people were celebrating and a few people who had guns were shooting the guns in the air. And the next day we got on another train and finally got to Krakow where a cousin of mine, my mother's, met us after a day we had survived the war in Warsaw under false papers. And so she took us under her wing. She was already looking after her niece. And then months or so later, um, her niece's father came back from concentration camp. So she looked after him. And then a few months later, my grandmother came back from Siberia and she looked after her. So this woman was like a saint. 
I mean, just amazing. Uh, she was a young woman in her 30s, and she undertook to look after all of us. My half-sister died in Siberia of typhoid, and it was really amazing that my grandmother, who was elderly, survived. So we had a small family, and I went to Polish public school, as did my brother. And um, I still have my report card. And um, apparently I did very well at school. <laughs> so I caught up somehow as far as Polish education was concerned. But then there was a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism in Poland after the war. And my grandmother was determined to get us out of Poland. And so my cousin um, was in touch with another cousin who lived in London. And between the two of them, they arranged for us to get on a kinder transport. So in 1946, left on a kinder transport to go to England. In your memoir, you uh, uh, talked about the representative from Hyas. And uh, the question that, that I had reading it was, uh, why did you, what was it about her or, or what she was doing that you had such confidence in what she was doing. It seemed like, uh, I mean, to turn your back on uh, the family that you had been living with and to put your hands in your life in the hands of somebody you had very little contact with. What, what prompted that confidence? Well, you know, I relied totally on my brother. Hmm. because he was older and whatever he said was okay, I accepted. Uh, first of all, I really dislike uh, our caretaker, the woman. She was hmm. very nasty. Second of all, all during our hiding, my brother kept telling me stories about our lovely life in Krakow before the war. Um, you know, he told us about, he told me about the cook, the, uh, the nanny, um, my father's legal practice, the family that would come over. Uh, every year we had a Christmas tree, which we decorated. And as you can imagine, uh, our Jewish family was not happy about that, but my father apparently told them that it was really for the cook, the nanny, the secretary, and the um, cleaning lady. <laughs> but, we, but of course, there were gifts under the tree for us. So, um, so my brother um, really kept that, although I remembered a lot about our life pre-war, but he kept those memories alive. Um, and also, the, just the idea of leaving this place which had been filled with such horror. Uh, I think I, I just wanted to leave. And since he trusted this woman, uh, I just called her. You did not spend time in any DP camp. Uh, went uh, and uh, tell us about your trip to England. Well, you you were on a Kinder transport. <laughs>
we left um, Gdynia, um, which is a port on the Baltic Sea. And from there, we went to Stockholm. And in Stockholm, we were met by the Jewish committee. And I couldn't believe how generous people were because they came with food and chocolate and bananas. And I thought anybody who gave away such wonderful food, they must be extremely wealthy because it was definitely food that we hadn't seen since before the war. And then we got on the train from Stockholm to Gettysburg and boarded another ship. And our grandmother had given me, given us uh, a big package of Polish sausage because she was afraid there wouldn't be anything to eat on, <laughs> on the ship. But of course we were well fed. And so the Polish sausage stayed in the backpack and started to smell rather terrible. And when we, well, there's the very famous Straits of Skagerrak Kattegat between uh, Sweden and Denmark, very, very difficult crossing. And it was horrendous. But, uh, it was a stormy night. It was just the ship was just being bounced all over the place. And I was very, very sick. And of course, having these, the smell of those sausages in the cabin didn't help. In any case, at some point, uh, my brother came, saw the terrible state I was in, and smelled the sausages. And called me out, got me up on the deck and threw the backpack into the sea to get rid of it and made me sit out in the fresh air, which was probably the best thing he could have done. Somehow I got over the seasickness, but by the time I got, we got to Harwich in England, I was so weak I could barely walk. And my cousin Ferga met us at Harwich and when she, we had to go through all sorts of immigration and medical inspection and that kind of work. But when we finally met her, all I could say was, yeah, I knew one Polish, one English word, which was quickly. And I remembered the word for water. So I in German. So I said quickly, Wasser. And when she heard me say quickly, she thought, oh, she speaks English. So she started speaking English to me. And of course, I didn't understand anything, but she realized I needed water. So she got me water uh, slowly. I got better. So it was a pretty traumatic. <laughs> um, were the uh, uh, other passengers on that ship all Jewish, or was it uh, the the children? The uh, children. They were all orphaned Jewish children, hmm. but there were other passengers. Yeah. So, what was your? Uh, tell us about your life in uh, England. You arrived in nineteen forty six. And uh, what was your life like? Well, um, my cousin, Perga Rose, um, was our caretaker. But in order to get permission to um, come into England, you had to have a financial sponsor. So she was a poor refugee. She had um, emigrated from Leipzig in Germany to England in 1938. 
she was already looking after two younger sisters. So she couldn't be the financial sponsor. She simply didn't make enough money. So she asked her boss whether he would sponsor me. And he very generously said yes. And then she got in touch with an uncle of ours in France who survived the war and who was a furrier and asked whether he would sponsor my brother. And he said yes, but uh, since he was living in France, the way the sponsorship worked was he sent the money to a furrier friend of his in London and that London businessman became my brother's sponsor. Mm -hmm. Then, since Herda lived in a single room, the question was, you know, <laughs> where would we live? And she was able to get both my brother and me uh, enrolled at this wonderful school called Bansport School, um, which was a school started by a German woman in the 1930s when she recognized that Hitler was taking over and she had a lot, she had a school in, in Germany and recognized that most of her students were Jewish and they needed to get out. She had moved her school to England with the help of um, two very famous Quaker families, the Cadburys and the Brown Trees, who were both uh, chocolate uh, makers in England. So she moved the school to Kent outside of London, the beautiful estate. And Herdna knew about the school because her youngest sister went there when she came uh, from her two younger sisters also came on a kinder transport, but before the war. 1939. So we were very fortunate to be able to go to that school. It was idyllic. And there were lots of refugee children there, some English children also. Um, very high level of education because most of the faculty was from Germany. Had been teachers in Germany or at the university in Germany. Unfortunately, in 1948, uh, the funding for the school was withdrawn. So the school had to close. My brother graduated in 1948, so he went on to work in the fur business in London. But I had to go on to high school. I was middle school. So Herda had to find another school, another boarding school for me to go to. Um, and the other wrinkle was that my uncle and friends who had been paying for our education died. And his son, no longer afford to, or he said he could no longer afford to pay for our education, or my education. He had two children of his own. So uh, then Herda was desperate to try and find somebody who could con continue financing my education. And my grandmother in Krakow suggested that she get in touch with my grandmother's niece in New York, Daisy. And Herda did, and Daisy very generously said yes, she would pay for my continued education at another boarding school, a very progressive co-educational boarding school. So that's where in Welling Garden City was where I went to school. And that's where I completed my high school.
You, you wrote in your um, memoir, we had been warned not to talk about the one experience we all shared, the traumatic loss of parents, family, home, and country. The devastation we had suffered was never discussed. The past was forbidden territory, it was buried. How did that silence affect you? And uh, when did you start talking about your past? You have to remember I was a teenager, tween teenager. Um, what I wanted most of all was to fit in. Um, the memories were very sad. So like any teenager, I tried to forget. And since nobody asked me, nobody wants to know anything, um, I just didn't talk about it. I remember when I was 11, um, because my grandfather had been the president of the neighborhood in Krakow, the London Benebereth, Berta got in touch with them and told them that I was in London, in England, um, as a testimony to my grandfather, they sponsored me to go to a Jewish summer camp in Switzerland. Hmm. And on the trip to Switzerland, one of the children English Jewish child asked me, you're an orphan. How did you spend the war years? And I said, I, I don't want to talk about it. And just shut it off. And it was the only time that a, a child asked me. And I was you know, I had been so well taught not to talk about it. I just mm. said, no, I'm not going to go. And no, no adult ever asked me. And after the war, really people didn't want to talk about the war. It was so traumatic for most people. The losses were so horrendous. Why go back? And, uh, you know, uh, psychotherapy was not something the English believed in. Uh, they felt that it was all about the stiff upper lip. Let's face it, the English suffered terribly during the war. You hardly ever heard anybody talk about the Blitz or about what they went through during the war. Uh, you just, um, um, that was water under the bridge and you went on and did what you had to do. So it was a very sort of stoic way of dealing with the past. So it really wasn't until I arrived in New York and Once in a while, people would ask. So did you uh, receive any uh, religious education in England? Um, but in both schools, the Bible was taught as literature, not as a religious um, hmm. document. So no, I, I didn't get any religious education hmm. ever. Hmm. First time I took a course about religion was at UC Berkeley <laughs> in uh, world religions. In your memoir, you referred to meeting uh, Israelis in England. Uh, did you, um, uh, were you ever interested in uh, immigrating to uh, Palestine, to Israel? 
in one of the rooming houses that I rented a room in London when I was going, uh, when I was working. Um, there was an Israeli young woman who came to London to study English. And through her, I met a group of Israelis who were studying English uh, in London. Um, and actually, I traveled with her my first trip youth hostling in in uh, Italy with her um, for a couple of weeks. Um, so I heard quite a bit about what was then very early days of, of Israel. Um, when we were in Poland, before we left, my brother had the choice of going to Palestine with a group of young Jewish boys and girls, but he decided against it. Uh, so no, I never, I never had that opportunity to go to Palestine early on. And then when we were living in England, um, I knew we had, Herta had a sister uh, who had emigrated to Palestine in the 30s and was living on the kibbutz. Uh, so I heard a lot about kibbutz life. Uh, it sounded very attractive to me because I had been brought up in a boarding school and it sounded sort of like, I liked boarding school, so it sounded sort of like boarding school. But uh, nobody ever suggested that I emigrate to Israel. Tell us about your journey from England to New York. How did that come about? Well, I was very unhappy in London. Um, I was living by myself in a rented room. Um, the only friend I had really was my uh, sponsor's daughter, who was several, several years older than I was, but uh, we went out to the cinema sometime or to a restaurant. Uh, I felt very alone. My brother was already in medical school in Bristol, so that connection was uh, broken. Uh, Herta's two sisters were still in London, but one was in medical school, the other one was working, going to night school, so they had very little time for me. Herta's brother, who lived outside of London, saw me a couple of times, but I was really pretty much by myself. Um, so when Daisy, my relative in New York, suggested that I come to New York, um, on the one hand, I was scared because it was another new country and new way of life. On the other hand, um, I would be with, you know, um, family and they wanted to adopt me. So um, it wasn't easy. Um, Daisy's husband, Heinz, came to London, took me to the U.S. Embassy, had to file a huge number of papers because I was on the Polish quota, which meant that I must probably still wouldn't be here <laughs> because the Polish quota was huge. Uh, it was so oversubscribed. There was such a 
enormous waiting list. But if they adopted me, then I would, you know, get a um, visa right away. So that's how they hit on the idea of adopting me so that I could come to New York. So I, I think I waited about six months, if I remember correctly, for the visa. And then I took, um, they booked me on the SS United States, which was the fastest ship at that time, three and a half days from Southampton to New York. And they were very, very excited when I arrived. You know, they, have, they were childless, they had no, no children. And by then they were in their fifties. And um, I was 19. <laughs> so all of a sudden to become a daughter, you know, I was so used to living an independent life or living in an institution that I, I just couldn't imagine living as a daughter with a family. Uh, so I was very anxious. But Daisy was very sensitive. She um, and practically immediately got me uh, an apartment, fortunately in the same building as they lived in. So I had my own apartment. Getting a job as opposed to London where there was a lot of anti-Semitism. So I couldn't get a job except in Jewish uh, enterprises. In New York, I had no problem whatsoever. I got a job right away with American Airlines and then American Airlines. So I had a very, very exciting life. Um, I was independent. I learned how to drive a car. I traveled. And mm -hmm. then 18 months later, um, Daisy died. So that was, you know, a tragedy for me. At that point, I figured that anybody that I loved was going to die. And I was mm. just a dead luck symbol. Mm. So, and Heinz, her husband, was devastated. Uh, he relied totally on her. He worked in the same travel agency. They were partners in the agency. So he persuaded me that I needed to join him in the agency, take his take Daisy's place, which of course terrified me because I was 20. <laughs> and how could I possibly take the place of somebody as skilled and educated as she was? Hmm. But uh, it was very exciting because I was sent on trips around the world to um, get oriented for about the travel business. Uh, and it was through the travel agency that I met my future husband, Marty, because his uh, mother was also working in that travel agency. So. Those, uh, so we got married in 1960 and we honeymooned in Cuba a year after uh, Castro took over, mm -hmm. which was everybody in New York told us you're crazy going to Cuba. You, there's nothing, nothing to eat, they're communists. So. God knows what will happen to you. <laughs> but we had a wonderful time. And it was a, a real political awakening for me. Uh, my husband had gone to the ethical culture schools in New York, so he was much more politically aware than I was. Hmm. To back up for just a couple of little facts, uh, do you recall coming into New York Harbor and seeing the Statue of Liberty 
and any memories associated with seeing the Statue of Liberty? Well, again, uh, you know, I was 19 years old, yeah. uh, very excited. But to be honest, um, obviously I was moved by the Statue of Liberty, but quite frankly, the most exciting thing was seeing the skyscrapers because I had never seen skyscrapers. <laughs> uh, what borough did you live in, in uh, New York City? You won't believe this, but I lived on Madison Avenue and 48th Street in Manhattan. Uh, huh. My office, when I worked at the travel agency, was on 46th Street and 5th Avenue. <laughs> so I walked all of two blocks to get to my office and with Heinz because he lived in the same building. Um, so how did the um, trip to Cuba affect you politically? I mean, well, <clears throat> I had been to Cuba under Batista. I had been to Cuba uh, a couple of years prior to Ahmed. So I had seen Havana because that was the only place I went on that first trip. I had seen Havana uh, under Batista and it was pretty shocking for me as a young woman. I was 21 at the time. Um, there were child prostitutes on the street. There were Got, uh, got, you know, guys with guns, obviously, um, doing God knows what sort of trades. Um, I was staying at the Nacional Hotel, which was the deluxe hotel in Havana at the time. Uh, the, the glitziness. <laughs> The, the amount of money that people were throwing around in the casino. Um, I mean, it was just really sickening. <laughs> um, huge cars, um, people wearing Paris fashions. So then we come to Havana in 1960. All the big hotels were taken over by, not all of them, because we stayed in a hotel, but most of the big hotels were taken over by the government or offices and whatever. Uh, the streets were totally safe. You saw no prostitutes. Uh, the only people you saw with guns were the guards around the uh, government buildings. Um, people seemed very happy. Um, the um, uh, educational system was thrown wide open. A lot of health clinics were opened for the first time, not only in Havana, but all over Cuba. So when we rented a car and drove around, it's not terribly far, but enough to see what was happening in the countryside. So um, we saw a tremendous change. Oh, I saw because my husband hadn't been to uh, Cuba. I saw a, a tremendous change. And to me, it was sort of shocking because now in America, I was told that Cuba was communist. And in my uh, view of communism what that was what I remembered from Poland. On the one hand, I was confused, but on the other hand, I thought, no, oh, this looks pretty good to me. Um, yeah, so it was sort of a, an awakening, a questioning. Mm -hmm.
memoir you wrote about your trip to Eastern Europe in 1960. Uh, how did that trip affect you? Well, our, our second honeymoon, <laughs> after we went to Cuba, we, um, I decided that I really wanted my husband to meet my grandmother and my cousin in Poland mm. and to get a feel for Krakow uh, so that he knew a little about my background, sort of my physical background, where I had grown up. Um, again, People told me not to go because um, it was behind the Iron Curtain and had been instances where people didn't come back, especially men. My, my brother refused to go back to Poland because he was of um, draft age and he could have been drafted. Um, so it was a bittersweet trip because um, now it's like going back to any place that you are familiar with. Um, I felt very comfortable in Krakow. I knew the streets, I knew every the shops where and so on. Uh, and of course I loved seeing my grandmother and my cousin. On the other hand, there were horrible memories too. And uh, anti-Semitism in Krakow was rampant. Uh, the, uh, the Jewish quarter was totally destroyed. The, the cemetery was full of graffiti. Uh, and, you know, it was during the Cold War. So Americans, of course, the younger generation would stop us on the street and want to talk to us. And, uh, mm. and a lot of the older generation looked at us as enemies. Mm. So it, it was a difficult, difficult trip. Mm. Kr Krakow uh, suffered, I think, very relatively little damage from the war. And uh, so I suppose buildings looked familiar, brought back memories that uh, you had uh, of Krakow. No, absolutely. Krakow was very fortunate. Such a historic city, you know, and it was left alone, sort of like Paris. Yeah. You were going to Poland and going to Cuba, going to two communist countries, did you, uh, how does that, uh, I mean, did you make some comparisons between the, uh, the two faces of communism in 1960? Well, of course, um, I wasn't sure that Cuba was actually communist. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Why did you move to San Francisco? Tell us about your journey from New York City to San Francisco. So my husband, Marty, had grown up um, in New York. His father was an engineer and an inventor. Um, he was the inventor of, you might remember the little kiosks where you took, uh, you put in a quarter and you would sit down and it would take four little photos of you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, programmatic. Uh, with a scope automatic. Um, that was his, he created that machine. Uh, so my husband um, led a very privileged life in New York. They had a huge apartment on the Central West. He went to private schools, went to Cornell for his university education. 
Um, and when his father died, very, very suddenly, um, Marty had to take over the business. And nobody told him that the business was in very, very bad shape. Um, so to make a long story short, what he had to do is basically sell off the business, which meant that uh, his privileged lifestyle was at an end. And uh, he had to find a job. So the two of us were working, not making a huge amount of money. And he could not really come to grips of living in New York and not being well off. He, he, he thought New York was just too expensive a city to live a decent life. Uh, you either were wealthy in New York or you were poor and lived the bohemian lifestyle, which is basically what we were living as a married couple uh, in the Chelsea area of New York. Um, that was number one. Number two, um, I think the memories of his father and what he went through were tied to New York and he wanted to leave that behind. Number three, he really did not get on with his mother, uh, really disliked her. And he was a young man, he was ambitious, and he felt that he wanted to get out of New York out of all the traditions and expectations of him and try to be an independent person. Um, so he was very keen to leave, leave behind his memories, <laughs> just as I was keen to leave behind my memories <laughs> in uh, Poland. Um, so he persuaded me, let's, let's try our luck someplace else. Um, of course, his mother couldn't understand how you know, uh, somebody brought up in New York could possibly live anyplace else. And Heinz was absolutely aghast that I would leave New York for the provinces, as he called them. Because obviously anything outside of New York was provincial. <laughs> so we took the summer off. We had saved up money. And we traveled. So we had a VW bus camper started out, uh, which was unfortunately totaled in Florida. So then we just had a VW bus, which then we just camped. Um, and we were looking for our perfect community. Um, and finally, we ended up in San Francisco and we just fell in love with San Francisco. And we thought, this is it. And Marty's brother was the professor at UC Berkeley. So at least, you know, we had one person <laughs> uh, connected with the family. And I knew. Uh, one of the, actually my brother's best friend from Bunsport School had married and lived in Piedmont. Uh, so I knew one person. Uh, so we decided this was it. We were going to live in San Francisco. How come you, as, as a recent transplant from Los Angeles, uh, I'm wondering why didn't you stop in Los Angeles? <laughs> or why didn't you settle there? That, <laughs> that's a place that has such a disconnect from New York that, uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, well, um, actually, <laughs> 
we never got to Los Angeles <laughs> because um, when we left Las Vegas, we left at night because we knew we had to get through the Mojave Desert. And we didn't have air conditioning, of course, <laughs> in the VW bus. <clears throat> By that time, I was so sick and tired of traveling that I said to Marty, and we had, Marty had an army buddy in San Francisco in whose garage we had whatever, we had sent a crate of a few things, which was in his garage in San Francisco. So I said to Marty, just let's, let's go as quickly as we can to San Francisco. So we traveled during the night, and the first place we stopped was Bakersfield <laughs> on 99, right? Uh, through Fresno and to San Francisco to us was sort of a uh, compromise that it was an American city, but it had a lot of European feel to it. Mm. So you know, we somehow felt comfortable. I believe from your memoir, you lived in San Francisco for a year. And uh, so what did you and Marty do during that year? Well, um, we found a little studio apartment on Buena Vista East, which was lovely. Um, I still remember it with great affection because it was so well designed and had such an incredible view of the Golden Gate and the Bay. And it was a lovely neighborhood. It was, um, it was pre-hippie. So there were a lot of Russian refugees living in that neighborhood. It was full of, um, there were several hospitals. So there were a lot of nurses and doctors living in that area. And Golden Gate Park was right there. So uh, we were exploring San Francisco and uh, having a wonderful time. I tried to get a job and found it very difficult. So my first um, job, <laughs> I had an Olivetti typewriter, uh, a portable, which I wish I had kept because it's now in every design museum in the world. It was such a beautifully designed typewriter. Um, and I got a job through a temp agency addressing envelopes. So for hours, I sat <laughs> and addressed envelopes. It was a real come down <laughs> from being a travel agent and traveling all over the world to addressing envelopes. But that's what I did for about two months. My husband got a job with the City of Hope, which is a uh, hospital uh, in Southern California, um, as a development uh, director uh, to raise funds. He hated the job, but it was the only job he could get. So he worked with that. And then I got a lucky break because that temp agency called me and said, oh, with your travel agency background, uh, there's a travel agency in the Clift Hotel uh, that needs somebody for three months. Would you be interested? And I said, oh, anything left <laughs> rather than addressing envelopes. So I went to work at this lovely uh, small travel agency with the owner was just so kind and uh, really a sort of parent figure. <laughs> was always anxious about my welfare. Um, and after three months, his partner came back. And But in the meantime, um, my boss uh, was looking out for me and he got in touch with um, the manager of customer services at the um, Western Pacific Railroad, which had its office on Western Pacific, had a whole building on Mission and First. And 
sent me there to, for an interview and I was hired because <laughs> of the reference. And so I spent the next couple of years, uh, couple of years close to two years, working for Western Pacific Railroad uh, for this very nice man. And the um, office was, I was the only female in the office. And by that time I was pregnant. And in those days, um, it was very iffy if you, could, if you could continue working if you were pregnant. So I tried desperately to hide the fact that I was pregnant. But at some point, even those very unaware men in the office recognized that something had changed. And they became like, uh, you know, mother hens. <laughs> uh, they just couldn't do enough for me. Oh, don't get up, I'll get it for you, you know. Uh, very, very sweet. And when I finally, about, I don't know, a week or two weeks before I was ready to they gave me a shower and their wives or their girlfriends or they just showered me with gifts for my baby. Uh, and the other thing that was astounding was my boss told me, oh, um, railroad workers are not under Social Security. They are under the Railroad Act. And under the Railroad Act, you get three months of maternity leave with pay. So off I went <laughs> for three months with maternity leave pay. I forget whether it was full pay or three quarters, but it was enough for us to live on because my husband had um, given notice uh, at the City of Hope and had started graduate studies at the University of California in business administration. And we were living in married student housing in Albany. So somehow we managed to live on whatever it was that my maternity leave was. And then after three months, I hired a uh, babysitter who came to our little apartment and went back to work. <clears throat> and my boss didn't think it was a good idea. He thought that um, I really should be with my baby. But I said, well, my husband is a student. And, uh, I have to support him. But then um, my husband got a job at the university. We bought a house and I got pregnant with my second child. Oh. And after about three months or so, I told my boss that I was going to leave. I was taking his advice. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, the next interview, your life in Berkeley from the 1963 to 1979, your evolution into uh, being a um, political person and a, uh, an office holder in uh, the city of Berkeley. So, but I really appreciate your time and information and it was, it's a real pleasure and honor to be participating in this oral history of you. Thank you, Michael, for being so well prepared with questions <laughs> and having read the <laughs> lengthy book so carefully. <laughs>